to the Auburn Avenue Research Library in African American Culture and History. My name is Victor Simmons. I'm the library administrator here. Um, I want to say a few thank yous before we get the program started. First and foremost, I'd like to thank all of you in attendance here today for your continued support of our library and what we do within the community. I want to thank Commissioner Natalie Hall for being here today with the proclamation. I want to thank Ms. Jocelyn Dorsey for agreeing to moderate today's program. We are truly appreciative of that. Um, I want to thank the entire Auburn Avenue staff for their hard work in making this possible. Um, many people don't realize the work that, that it takes to make a program like this happen, and each and every one of them played their part in this. Um, it was truly a team effort, uh, which leads me to my next thank you, which is the person who coordinated the entire thing, and that is Ms. Gloria Strong, Mrs. Gloria Strong. Um, <laughs> she has been uh, amazing in this in this role. Um, she's amazing in her day to day. We depend on her for pretty much everything. She is the backbone of what it is we do here at Auburn Avenue Research Library. So it is of no surprise that this program is what it is today because she is amazing. Um, so thank you, Mrs. Strong. Um, and lastly, I want to thank all of the greetings here in attendance, to those who could not make it, to those who have transitioned, your diligence, your determination um, is inspiring. Um, and it is truly an honor for us here at the Auburn Avenue Research Library to hold your collection and, and be at, in the presence of all of you. You are truly amazing individuals, and there is not enough thank yous that I can say that can even come close to the amount of thank yous that you all deserve. Um, you are truly a treasure to the community here in Atlanta and wherever you work. Um, nurses are uh, often often looked over, and they shouldn't be, because <laughs> I know for a certain fact that I, I grew up in hospitals, but my entire family worked in some sort of role within hospitals, and I see all the work that you've done, and thank you all. Thank you for being here. Thank you for all the work that you do. With that, I will introduce our first speaker. Commissioner Hall is passionate about making a positive impact in the lives of the citizens of Fulton County. She previously served Fulton County faithfully for six years as the Chief of Staff to the late Fulton County District 4 Commissioner, Joan P. Garner, and has over 25 years of management experience as a public and private sector. On the, on the County Commission, Commissioner Hall serves as executive sponsor for Fulton County's strategic priority, All People Are Healthy. She believes in a holistic approach to health that includes, but is not limited to, having good physical and mental health, access to healthy food, access to quality health care, gainful employment, and obtaining an overall quality of life that sustains the individual and their family. Please join me in welcoming the Fulton County Commissioner of District 4, Commissioner Natalie Hall. Thank you. Um, this is truly an honor to present this proclamation because nurses are the individuals who provide us with that tender love and care that we need when we're not feeling well and when we're sick and we're seeing the doctor. They're the ones that comfort us and provide us with that nurturing that we need when we're not feeling well. So the proclamation reads, whereas Atlanta was a hub for medical services, education, and facilities for African Americans in Georgia in the 19th and 20th centuries, where several prominent physicians, hospitals, and schools emerged to serve, educate, and make a positive impact on African American communities in spite of obstacles imposed in the segregated South. And whereas Gray Memorial Hospital was one of the few hospitals established in Georgia during the 19th century where both rich and poor, whites and blacks, could go for medical attention. And whereas the Grady Hospital School for Nurses was established for white students in 1898, and the Municipal Training School for Colored Nurses was established in 1917. And whereas Grady's registered nurses continue to flourish, 
while serving in many positions from student nurses to worldwide leadership, providing excellent nursing services where they, was, where they resided in urban, rural, suburban, and metropolitan areas throughout the world. And whereas today, Great Memorial <laughs> Hospital continues its initial mission to serve all people, regardless of race or status, in the Atlanta area. And whereas in celebration of National Nurse, Nurses Month, the Auburn Animal Research Library will host a community discussion titled The Colored Unit, Stories of the Segregated Grady Memorial Hospital School of Nursing, 1920-1966, that will focus on the racially segregated school of nursing operated through Grady Memorial Hospital, known by most during that time as the Grady's. Now, therefore, be it resolved that the Board of Commissioners of Fulton County recognizes National Nurses Month, celebrates the history of African American graduates of the Grady Memorial Hospital School of Nursing, and does hereby proclaim Saturday, May 4th, 2019, as the Colored Unit Nurses of Grady Memorial Hospital School of Nursing Day in Fulton County, Georgia. Congratulations. <laughs> As the first African American anchor of the Channel 2 newscast, as well as the first African American news anchor in the Atlanta market, from 1973 to 1983, Ms. Dorsey was an anchor, reporter, producer, and assignment editor for WSBTV's Channel 2 Action News. Ms. Jocelyn Dorsey was also executive producer and regular contributor to People to People, a weekly half an hour public affairs program broadcast on Channel 2. Ms. Dorsey has won numerous awards for her work with WSB-TV, including seven Southeast Regional Emmys for editorial, editorial excellence from the National Academy of Television, Arts, and Science. She was the first African-American inducted into the same organization, Silver Circle, for more than 25 years in the field of journalism. She was also the first woman and the first African-American to receive Georgia Association of Broadcasters, Broadcaster Citizen of the Year, a lifetime achievement. Now retired from Channel 2, WSB TV, <laughs> <laughs> after 45 years of service, she deserved it. We are proud to have Ms. Jocelyn Dorsey, Ms. Jocelyn Dorsey as our moderator for today's program. Please join me in welcoming Ms. Dorsey. Thank you. Housekeeping while they're figuring out how to turn on their microphone. Um, could you all silence your cell phones, please? And ladies, if you would turn on your microphone so we get somebody to help. And I know it may feel awkward to you, but when you answer questions, be sure you hold that microphone up because people won't be able to hear you as well. And I may have to remind you because we're also broadcasting on Facebook Live. <laughs> Technology at work. One thing I do have to say that they didn't put in there is that um, my biggest hobby is riding a motorcycle. <laughs> and in 2007, I rode one from Alaska to Key West um, for Special Olympics. Usually people talk about that. <laughs> That's all it is. But we're not here to talk about that. <laughs> we're here to talk about some wonderful historical women who have been pioneers in the field of nursing. Um, I've read their bios, but it doesn't begin to talk about their journey. 
And that's what I hope we'll be able to talk about today. There will be time for question and answer, so I'm not going to hog the whole program. Um, but there are a lot of questions I have, and hopefully I'll cover a lot of your questions as well. First of all, I'd like for you to introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about you, each one of you. And there is no time limit. <laughs> so we want to hear as much about your journey, you know, how you grew up, um, what inspired you to become a nurse, and then we'll go from there. Um, my, my name is Sally Lee. Brown Howard. Yes, I'm close. I'm gonna get on you now. All right. my, my name is Dr. Spinney. Dr. Yeah. Susan Brown Howard. And um, I uh, joined the Great Plan in 1959. And uh, I was uh, the reason I went into nursing because uh, an early marriage, early divorce, a small child, and I realized I had no way to take care of my daughter. And I didn't want my daughter to uh, end up suffering because of what mistakes I might have made. But the point is, I think uh, I went one day to uh, the school, South Florida, I was doing some uh, supply teaching, and the nurse came in to talk with me uh, through the stair about being a nurse. I became interested myself and I left the I left the area and went to the principal's office and called Grady in uh, the educational portion of it and I was able to get an application and from that from there on the ball started. Had it not been for Grady, make no mistake, I Grady was the best place, the uh, best thing that could happen. He has his downs, his, his, his spit balls, and his, um, his high too. Um, I am a Grady baby. <laughs> <laughs> I was born. I was in the age, I was born. <laughs> and I, uh, my brother said I fell on my head. My mother squatted down. She gave birth to me. I lived uh, 777 Hubbard Street, which was about five or six blocks or more from Gray Hospital. But my mother was unable to um, provide, she was unable to get prenatal care for me. So I was a real strange looking soul when I was born. And uh, my daddy said, told my mother, if you ever have another baby, I don't want to see you look like this. <laughs> So my sister, well, you never know it. <laughs> <laughs> I weighed about two or three pounds, and there was no, there was no incubator, there was no sleep, they didn't care for me. But, and I was not supposed to live uh, past 10 years old, but I had outlived everybody in my family and been able to take care of everybody. The nursing brought me that loss. The Lord had another plan for me, and I do believe in Him. And um, so that's how I got to the Grady's. My daughter was standing in the door when I got ready to leave that morning. I never shall forget that hazy morning. And she said to me, "Mama, Mommy, are you going to leave me here all by my little self?" <laughs> I can't tell you how it tore my heart up, but it would have torn it up even more. And I said, she wouldn't get mad even she was today, and even with her brother turned to it. Management told me. Please call me Jocelyn, but not <laughs> My name is Jacqueline uh, Kane Hall. My son is telling me, and my brother. But anyway, uh, I was born in Miami, moved to New York, and then when my parents split, we moved back to the South. Next to Brady, that was the best thing that happened to me. Even though it was segregated, I loved growing up in Birmingham, where more common than everybody else was, but it was wonderful because of my family. Uh, we knew how to behave, and like I tell people, 
I mean passive aggressive and all that stuff, so I learned how to connect on the ground. I did not want to become a nurse. Finally, I think probably until my senior year, because I loved all the sciences and I was trying to decide what did I want to do. Then I loved the library. I said I would be a librarian. I was fortunate enough. My family told me I would never work for white folks as a uh, babysitter. They didn't believe in that. Even a lot of people in my neighborhood were doing that, and I think I understand it more now because of the sexual and mental abuse that people were experiencing. I didn't know, you know, why I couldn't do it. But my aunt, God rest her soul, she worked in the uh, hospital there. And I begged and begged, I want a job, I want a job. Because, too, I think that my mother was separated, there were three of us. And I wanted to at least buy my candy, my shoes, my whatever. And so finally, in the eighth grade, which was probably against the law, uh, they sneaked me. She worked in the laundry department, and they loved her. She loved her supervisor. And they permitted me to work in the dietary department at a hospital there. And I would go to school, get off, catch the bus, so she could drop me off at the hospital. I would work from uh, 4 to 7, come home, stay up 11, 12, or whatever, to get my homework. And then on Saturdays and Sundays, I could work from 6 a.m. To, to 6 p.m. But the thing about it, you weren't working all that time. But once you clocked in, if you stayed on the premises, you got paid for 12 hours. So I tried not to go town to town with my 12 hours worth of money. So there, uh, the dietitian, of course, uh, she was Caucasian and all. But that impressed me. I said, hmm. And so I started talking to her, what about a dietitian? And she said very kind and candidly, well, yeah, that's a possibility because there's an excellent school in Tuskegee, Alabama, where you can become a dietitian. But I tell you, your chances for getting employment, there are only a few dietitians in hospitals and a few dietitians here and there behind. So I thought about that. I love talking about what I did. I love that. But I kept thinking, kept thinking. And then my mother started talking about nursing because she had a classmate who had finished grade. And so I talked with her, and I can't believe until this day that hospital is equivalent to the size of Brady now. But out of that hospital, they permitted this one black nurse. I said she must have been eight year old real because she was she worked over on the Caucasian side. She never worked on our side, so she you knows she had to be free. So anyway, I talked with her, and I talked to my uh, mother's friend who graduated from Brady. And when she told me the tuition was only $300, my brother was that talented I had a baby brother who was going to go to college after me. And they said, well, if you go there three years, then you can go to Tuskegee anywhere else you want to go to get your baccalaureate degree. And so that's what I decided to do, is go to Grady. And not only that, the uh, nurse told me that I could read a scholarship. So I love me some Coca-Cola today. Because <laughs> <laughs> Coca-Cola paid the scholarship. Oh, uh, $300. But uh, it wasn't free. They got that for him. Grady got more. Yeah, well, <laughs> 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 so, like I said, next to Birmingham and being at Grady, and being Grady was right in the middle of downtown. And that how lovely right. can you be? <laughs> Auburn Avenue was popping. I mean, all kinds of stuff. Yates and Milton, the yeah. drugstore, the movies. Hanged out at midnight as everybody wants to sit down there and see. And what was neat to my class, uh, got here about two weeks before uh, they graduated. And guess where I stayed my freshman first two weeks? Gilms Hall in the senior dorm. Oh, that's it. The girls were so angry with us. You know, but they were too much they know, but we didn't hear. <laughs> so I got a chance to meet all my homeboys from Birmingham. Bless enough, but I love being in Atlanta. I have lived a lot of places. I don't want to live anywhere else. And I love that Grady is right down the street. And my middle child is a great thing. So, I'm Janice Willis. I'm a 1961, um, 64 graduate, and I became interested in nursing at the age of three. I had a sickly childhood. I was in the hospital in and out. So I saw the nurses in white, and that's what I wanted to be from that. From age three, that's what we, that's as far back as I could go, and that's why I could go back because of um, being in the 
hospital. So I just kept that vision. But I went to Catholic school, elementary Catholic high school. I thought I was, I'm from Savannah, I thought I would just go to St. Joseph Catholic Nurses School. And that's where the break stopped. They didn't accept black nurses. And I didn't know at that point, they sent me a letter denying uh, and saying that I could go to trade school. And at that point, I happened to meet a friend whose mother was a Grady graduate. And that's how I found out about Grady. And I applied, I was accepted. And I came at age 17, and I was very naive, very scared, and but I stuck with it. Uh, here I am today, uh, retired Grady <laughs> <laughs> Well, tell me, I'll continue asking you the question because um, that was your career goal, and um, you came at an early age. What was it like? What, what was the biggest thing that you found could have been a barrier for you? I think being young. Most of my classmates were 18. I had come up on the nuts, and I was just very disciplined. And I came in, and I, all I wanted to do was study and be a nurse. And I was scared. I was just frightened. Of, uh, I had nuns as teachers, but they accepted us. When I came to grade, and I still had white teachers, but I was afraid of them. And that was the total difference, you know, in me going to grade it with being afraid of all my instructors, like if anybody remember Miss Snyder, even Miss Dixon, uh, no, 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 no. being afraid of it. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I heard it. Oh, Lord. <laughs> what was that about? What was she like? Oh, Yeah. Very condescending. And um, you know, you get ready. You had Charlie in blue, and he was in the morning, and Charlie in red, and he was in the evening. And you, if you stand up trying to charge after somebody has you give the patient a bath, and the patient decide, and the patient was smoking, the patient, the patient was smoking inside the hospital at that time, and he pulled his cigarette over in the bath water along with his urine and there was no, no such thing as getting in the rubber glove. You go in with your hands and you did everything with your hands. And so anyway it was her. <laughs> so uh Miss Snyder was one that would stand up behind you and watch every move you made. And uh, in the meantime, she'd tell you about the fact that she was going to go to military school. I think it was what? Oh, oh, the military school. And so, um, but she had this little smirk and smile. You, you just didn't know where she was coming from. It, the thing that was bothering me, you never knew when you were going to do something wrong and get put out. That's the whole thing that I felt over my shoulders all the time. Because we did have a student that was put out at 11 o'clock at night. I think it was about 10 when we heard the phone ring. Yeah, and we heard the phone ring, and we heard the phone, and nobody would ring the phone after like 9 o'clock. So we knew something was up. Now, I'm the prayer in the group, I'm the person too, so I said, let's pray. Okay, so I mean, it's time to pray. I mean, you better know God. The same verse. We prayed for everything. And, and so they asked her to get dressed, get fully dressed. You know, like uh, Miss Willis over here, and to go over to uh, the director of the nursing office. When she got over that, that she said, he stayed up and waited for her. And it, Look like it took an hour and maybe two hours for her to come back. When she came back, she said, I've been terminated. We broke our hearts. And we said, Why? She said, Because they gave her two zeros on one paper. 
and everything, it was always something to, to bring our spirits or try to bring our spirits. But one thing we had within our group, we had camaraderie. We were some tight, you couldn't get a wedge in between us. Was if you told something to me, Jackie would know what I was saying, said. Everybody declared Melba would know, and we would say the same thing. So don't ask us, though, we're going to say the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> when they're talking, and the mics are all hot or open, so you all can talk. You don't have to wait uh, to be asked a question. You can join in, because I do want this to be a great conversation. But um, was there ever a time that you really thought that you wouldn't see light at the end of the tunnel? Yes. <laughs> I got called over. I got called over to the director of education. And I know she can name out when I call her. I thought, Lord, have mercy. My stomach started hurting. My shoes got too tight. And, you know to do. and I didn't know, Lord, please have mercy on me. You know, I got family at home. All I want to do, I wash your clothes, I do anything, just don't do nothing, don't put me out. So when I got this, uh, the, the director of election, uh, the director of education's office, she said that she had a letter, <coughs> and I saw the letter that someone had sent that were that looked like it had grease or something on it. It wasn't professionally written, and they said that. I was dating a white doctor. And Lord have mercy, I didn't know I was going to fall through the chair, over the chair, or what. But let me tell you something. One thing I learned by being, I lived in college park. You had to talk two ways. That's the black way, and, and talk like you had, you know, talk up like you. I said, Lord, have mercy. I, I, don't, I don't know who did that. I said, but you know, I know better than they white folks. I wouldn't date no white man. You know better than that. I don't own it. Oh, I What am I going to do with my dog? What am I going to do with me? Oh, now if I don't get out of here, I'll never get out of here. <laughs> so she listened to me, and I did. And I, I was true, I was honest. And she tore up that letter and had put it in the press. She said, it will not go any further here. Now, had it gotten to the director of nursing, that was another way. I wouldn't have graduated. I wouldn't be sitting here. So, yeah, I had a lot of, a lot of calls. My OR said, I to say, I Eating in the cafeteria when I was supposed to eat in the cafeteria. Going across from that white side, that black side to that white side, and I saw that lettuce and tomatoes. And lettuce and tomatoes, that lettuce was so green. And the tomatoes were so pink. And we had choke sandwiches. And I was and with peanut butter and jelly. Yeah. <laughs> and so I went over to get one of my classmates, like a good friend here, she said, don't go so you're going to get put out soon. I said, I'm going tonight. I'm not eating a choke sandwich tonight. So I went over and I stood and I looked real stupid. You know how you look like. <laughs> <laughs>
that I can just beat the system. <laughs> I know one day, one thing that happened is we really worked more than eight hours, probably 12 or 15 hours a day because our classes were in the morning, say from 7 to 11. First of all, we had to go to Vesper at 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning, you know, to sing the gospel or whatever you do in the morning times. And then you go to breakfast and then you go to work. Now, if you work evenings or nights, and see, uh, the reason why I said the three hundred dollars was a piece of cake because uh, we had nursing instructors on the day shift, and they would stay over maybe to five or six. But we had no nursing instructors at night. Once you got your cap, I guess probably you could get nine months and all. Imagine this: two bright freshman students. I mean, we hadn't been in nursing school that long. They said they were to your senior year. But we come the night shift. So no matter how, we had to rely on each other. And then they had a supervisor, but we didn't have to close to get instruction, you know, by the instructor. So this particular, I think, one of the reasons, like I said, I get so wrapped up in anger and covered and don't talk about it. But then I worked from midnight to uh, seven in the morning, run over there to eat breakfast. Vespa had a nine o'clock class. This went on for weeks and weeks and weeks. Oh, wow. Oh, yes. So by that time, <laughs> I guess I was over I was wrong all uh, over wherever we were. I told my classmates, just like you said, we get together. I said, I'm, I'm not going to that state. I said, I'm tired. I'm going to sleep. And so what happened is in the dormitory, there was just one telephone, and they would call the house parent, and then the house parent would call it to the floor over okay. there. For the director here. And I said, now, there will be other people who got off. So I said, I tell them, don't, don't call me because I'm not coming to the phone. So most of them adhered to it. And then I think even the uh, final, the house mother came up. So I guess I said, well, this must be serious. I had no clue. And so that's what it was. It's just the house mother come up and it's none of my classmates were knocking the door. So that's when I wasn't coming. And I was angry and I was tired. I'm not that tired. But like I said, you know, just get. And so what they did for me is, and I love her, she was one of the best teachers, and she was one of us, I don't know what got to her, but she reported me to the head <laughs> uh, house mother. Oh. She lived across the street, you know, on the other side. Right? So anyway, I went in like, Sue said, Dr. Howard, uh, I uh, I didn't do a whole lot of yes, ma'am. It, it was polite enough, not like it. We're in quite this country. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't have a head saw on my head. <laughs> <laughs> so, what's up? I don't know nothing about her. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's pretty much how it happened. It was just so much. But there was never a time I thought I would leave. Because, like I said, I figured I could always get over it. That's the last thing. If I couldn't get over there, maybe I could put out there. So that's about the worst thing that I did last year. <laughs> <laughs> we had fun. It was hard, but we, we, we figured out a way out. What was the pattern? I thought, I thought that I was going to leave. In 1963, there was a fire in the dog. Mm -hmm. And I happened to witness someone in the hallway who was catching the elevator. And the only thing was, I didn't have my glasses on. <laughs> so I couldn't really tell them. But I really think that person was the person because I lived on the last room and the fire started in the kitchen. And I felt that somebody was trying to frame me. And I had to go to the office to Ms. Hammett, fire chief, two times, trying to defend myself that I had nothing to do with it. So at that time, I really, really, really thought, and once Ms. Hammond called me in, because this was my freshman year, I had gone to the student health for claims. And she called me to the office, to the nursing office, and said, if you plan to stay here, then you got to live with it. And I never went back to that. I don't think I ever went back to the student hill. <laughs> but I think we were, I came in at 120 of us, 66 of us graduated. 
which I do believe a lot of us will read. Micah. 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 Um, I came in uh, with 120 in my class. I graduated 66. And um, I think we will read it out. Everybody just didn't fail academically. Oh, yeah. And people were threatened by clinical instructors. I think. I don't remember anybody having an attitude, but I think if you just look <laughs> the wrong way, they could, you could have academics, but they could certainly fail right. clinically. And that's how a lot of us got out um, clinically. For the whole, for the stockings with the, you know, you have stockings. A stocking with the slides, um, you the side, you got to put it on the inside. Miss Hammond was, I mean, I'm going to see so many, but anyway, she would, you would be up to have a curtain drawn around the table. The patient was secure. The patient, you got the bed pen under the patient, and it was a little bit, a little late, so you got something on the bed, and you got something in the bed pen. And Miss, that lady would come up behind you and ask you about fan folding the curtains. Yeah. I mean, can you imagine you had to fold the curtains, fan fold, mm -hmm. and you sitting there with your arms up to stuff, and um, <laughs> she's asking you about, now, did you fan fold the curtains? <laughs> <laughs> That's the worst, I mean, you <laughs> and that was our director's nurse. And I was just sitting on the other side. The questions that she asked, asked and I did. I said, This lady must not know me about a patient here. I never heard her ask a single question or say a single thing about a patient. I mean, it was, you know, what's the first thing you mean? You know, used to have to feel on this in Japan, so. We had um, we had one of our uh, uh, students, um, our first assistant in my class, and I was so much that she could be here. She was telling about a when after the patient deceased, and you did the post long care, and you grabbed the patient, and you had to go. In. We were all in. Oh, by the way, we were C and D. Right. Yeah. C and D. Twice were A and B. It was the strangest thing. We never, we never, we never heard of them. It's just like they went back. We never saw them. And they ate on A, B, everything was A, B, C, D. And we just, we just isolated. We were just absolutely isolated. And uh, she said she had to prepare the patient to take the patient to the mall. It was late at night. And she said, so she said, I had to take that patient in patient. And she showed up and kind of had it. And so what happened is they said, what happened was <laughs> <laughs> she was going down the hallway in the ER in the E part of the E wing. E wing. Right. Yeah. That's where you could get, you know, all your people coming up to you, uh men and food and all that kind of stuff. But anyway, she was going and the wind was blowing. And so the white nurses was over on the AV side looking at her, struggling to take the patient down to the mall. The wind was also looking at her. The wind blew the sheet off of the patient. <laughs> she said she didn't stop running. <laughs> What is wrong with you? She said, man, you got up. <laughs> Down stairs on the not on the stretcher on the gurney 
but I had to take the baby down in my arms. Mm. And that, I, I can't say it to you, Pastor Sam. I mean, because the point is, it frightened me so bad. You frightened a child, and I was a child, when, yeah, 18, 19 years old, into a situation like that. Yeah, Tommy. Me. I mean, you, all kinds of things go slippery. There was nobody to deal with us on a psychological uh, basis as to how we feel, what we feel uh, about us and so. And other than we had a psychologist who was there, and he told us we were black. <laughs> and he told us uh, we came in late all the time, and that's what we did at church. So all of those things, you can all the other three years and talk to my friend. You know what I always think when I hear stories like that, um, and when my son died, and Mrs. King, was with me, and she said, you know, that's just the Lord preparing me for your next battle. Do you think now, looking back, that that may have been what was going on for you? Because what was your next battle is the hospital, right? Yeah. And so how was that? Well, I graduated and worked at Grady, and I'm going to say, uh, there I experienced a different kind of industry make a continuation because I love working in the evenings and I do overtime and all of it. But when I finally decided I wanted to go to day shift, I noticed all the Caucasian nurses that work on the war with me or you know you see them around. They stay on the evenings or whatever for two seconds. And they got the day shift to day shift. That was one reason why I had an opportunity to meet Brady and I did. Because, I mean, time after time after time, you know, the seniority didn't matter, the skills didn't matter, and I mean, I cover the house wherever they need to pull me, you know, whether it's a medicine, surgery, or whatever, and I was, I don't even, oh, they finally put me down in the surgical intensive care unit. This is when it first opened. The only equipment we had is probably uh, a breathing machine, and something else, and a few of the needles, but they didn't have any of those monitors, they just had the regular cardiac monitors that you see in the operating room on TV. I mean, in the patient's room, but that was the big time cardiac monitor. So, without my request, I guess because I was such an excellent nurse, they <laughs> sent me down there to open, you know, to be on that opening up unit. I will tell you what that and that was seeing patients die, and especially the babies. Uh -huh. But then, God rest his soul, you're not supposed to call her name, everybody knows Mrs. is Verde Bellamy. <laughs> one of the first black nurses at the VA hospital. I think she was probably the second, because I think Rita Ward was the first. Right. And so, and, and while I'm talking about it, she was a super, super, super nursing instructor, and social instructor, and some of everything else. So she was asking me, how are you doing? And so she was trying to recruit nurses go to the VA too, because when I started working there in 67, there were three black nurses at the VA. Wow. I made the fourth one. Mm -hmm. And uh, so but anyway, uh, I was fed up and I didn't know anything about the thing about the VA, you know, but it was another place to go and she worked there and I said, hey, if she worked there and she was the first black nurse to integrate the university school of nursing also. So uh, when I told them finally at the grade that I was getting to leave, then they wanted to give me day shift. They wanted to give me, you know, and you know, I, I just about told them what they could do with it. <laughs> they read it on my face. <laughs> when I was too Southern Christian, you know, lady back in the day. Yeah. <laughs> and you don't want to burn us for you. They were not told them to leave alone. Right. <laughs> Another interesting thing, too, is we were students. The uh, doctors, I didn't have any problems with them. Some, some people did. But I know uh, there were no black doctors in the hospital. Yeah. Absolutely not. They had a private hospital 
that started Spelman and then uh, was transferred over to uh, Macklin and, and different places. And then even when Keith's Farm was built, I think it opened and it started in 58 or 59. Anyway, they could have the black doctor there, you know, and but if the person really needed care beyond what Keith's Farm could offer, they were not granted privileges. So they they let their patients come over to uh, Grady. And even uh, as they were beginning to integrate Grady, they would not get the doctor's permission to uh, come over there. So there were all kind of other things that you know, got intermingled with whatever was going on. But uh, the doctors there, uh, I was asking the young ladies today, what were they called by the doctors? <laughs> I'll let them tell you what they said. But I distinctly remember Dr. Gerberg to the black nurses as a nurse, Nurse Kane. And you were here up and down the hall at the elevator. Hello, Miss, Miss Brown. Hello, Miss Brown. But everything was nurse, nurse. I never heard one male call me Miss. But uh, I said, at least they didn't use the N word. The other N word. It could have been the real big N word. Yeah, so that was another major. Um, I must say, I didn't, uh, I thought that they treated me very nicely and were part of teaching things, and I had, had no problems with the doctors. Well, all I knew was the black side, so I had nothing to compare as a student because I only worked with white doctors and black patients. Only after when we integrated in 65. Did I notice difference in the care, difference in the treatment? Yeah, that, that That's really when I was yeah. able to compare. That was when I was able to come in the front door of Grady, too. I see wow. a couple of times, because like I said, I don't know why you get home. But I would come in the front door. What are you talking about? Yeah, we came in the side door. You know. And I remember all the doors. A, the A and B side, the only time I got to go on the A and B side to take a patient back from the OR, which was the only integrated place that I know at Grady. And um, when I would go on the, their side, they would like have five or six patients. Mm -hmm. We could come on our side, and the capacity was probably about 36, but we had them in the hall with curtains around them. They were at the end of the hall because we were overstaffed. And even back then, I used to think to myself, the nurses over on the white side just sitting there with nothing to do. And there we were, even as students, we had to take care of maybe four patients before nine o'clock and go to class. They go to class, but they were supposed to be completed before we left. And then we would, after class, come back. And it always, in the back of my head, I said, this is, isn't right. Mm -hmm. There was nothing that we could say or do. But I think because of the workload, uh, that's why we got the reputation of being some of the best nurses all over the United States. Right. If you're a great nurse, you had a baby. You can organize anything, yeah. anywhere, out of any condition. I mean, least and make and do the best. Uh, something I was saying, have you ever heard of the Grady's? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, the Grady's is still around. You know, they, they still call the Grady's the Grady's. And most people don't know why there is one building with two Grady's. Well, the two Grady's come from the fact that you had black and white. One was a white Grady, one was a black, so you just call it the Grady's. And, uh, you knew that there's so there's so many things that are injustices. For instance, I was working the uh, emergency, emer uh, medical emergency. You had two people coming in, one black and one white, with the same identical thing, two males, and uh, upper respiratory infection, uh, temperature 102 or three called, uh, you know, yellow spew, et cetera, the same. But the white person gets the codeine 
and go to the cocktail of the brain and would help the person stop coughing, whereas the black person would not get the same treatment. So I have never, you know, after I got to be an RN and got some little, little, little figures about the name, I didn't mind asking ask the question. And it sounds like they did it without the car across. Um, <laughs> uh, I said, can you please tell me what, uh, why did you give this patient? Uh, why do you, you treat me differently? What are you trying to say? That's what the doctor said to me. I said, I'm not trying to say anything. I ain't saying, you know, that that you, there's a discrepancy in the way you're treating both these patients they have the same. Well, what do you think uh, that, uh, that they should have? That's not, what do you think? You're the one who assess the patient beyond triage. So what do you think? Anyway, I intervene a lot of times on the part, on the, um, on the patient's behalf. One time we were going to send a person that I care very much about from the main clinic over to the diabetic clinic with a blood sugar of 500. <laughs> and that person stopped by the store, little snack bar, and got candy on the way. <laughs> and I happened to see in signing out the patients. I happened to see what happened. And I went crazy. It was not, it was just the opposite of what I told you. I was black and I was trying to make safe. Uh, it was just the opposite of that because there comes a time when we do have to stand up for our rights and do what we know is best. And to be um, to be person said will intervene on behalf of our brother and our sister when you see that that things are not going well and care is not given quality quality care. And I'm all out. We are a, a person who who fight for the quality of care. We have very good persons within our classroom that did a lot of things uh, beyond that of just being a great friend, which is good. But we have uh, now uh, a pastor there, and uh, she is she's the first finish. First director of African American Director of mm -hmm. Public Health. Right across the street, forty by one. Yeah, from the great. So that and that's just a language you have to. That, you know, that's that certain language you have to speak. That certain language you have to speak. I was I was thinking about some other things that happened to me when I was. So there were many things that happened that could put you out. Uh, the, 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 my classmates were very very uh, cordial to me in keeping. My daughter, my daughter became little Miss Grady. She's big Grady now. <laughs> She's over there. Um, but she, uh, they, they helped me to, to bring her up as a child and a young woman and support me 100%. Who can tell you something? Go ahead. I'm going to tell you something interesting too. You talked about segregation, how, my, my, how ironic it is that this is a school nurse. And so at the time, 1959 to 1962, the American Nurses Association and the Georgia Nurses Association had just been integrated, and that was because of Ida Sandy, who's now deceased. She was the first, uh, first one of the first members, if not the first members, that went to the Georgia Nurses Association. Now, when we were students, believe it or not, we were whatever you were calling us back in those days, and they were Caucasians. But we were permitted to belong to the Georgia Nurses Association. They had their meetings in their dormitory. We had our meetings in our dormitory. We never talked about anything. However, when it came time to go to the Georgia Nurses Association Georgia meeting, guess who went? <laughs> I was the only person of color from Brady that went, and I think uh, that hospital in Columbus 
Georgia may have had a fact. But, uh, and then what we did is we, I don't know, we just did it through instructors, because I can't remember whether I ever met Carol, or they told us we were discussing when we got there. So in other words, we voted as one school of nursing, even though they had their agenda and we had our agenda. Okay, so what's the Georgia thing? And like I say, you know, I guess I wanted to achieve and experience and get out. They all say, uh, in the girls' dormitory, who was in Georgia, the nurses is like, where's Salmon Hospital? Was that in the vessel or the I don't know. I was the only one at the meetings. Guess where I stayed? I paid anybody to guess where they housed me. Hmm? In the hospital. It was on the wall. <laughs>
And I said, well, I bet Dr. Pete. And uh, he said, hmm. he said, um, I had appointed a white nurse, head nurse. That was the only nurse I thought to be a assistant to take care of the patients who were, because we had psychiatric patients. So uh, take care of the patients. But she seemed she was okay. He said, we like her. The doctors like her better than they like you. <laughs> I was so stunned. I couldn't close my mouth. My mouth was dry, you know, just... I couldn't believe that he was looking at my in my face. And you know, I am so glad I know the Lord. I am so glad I know the Lord. He would not allow me to open my mouth. <laughs> so, so what I did but come out. Right. You know, I was I, I was appalled. I mean, here I was, I was a gracious nurse. And I, I was doing a heck of a job. Everybody told me I was a good nurse. Everybody, they wanted me to work over the hours at night, and I didn't want to do that. And when he said that, I couldn't say anything. I just turned around and walked out. And later on, I was called by Job Corps, and I accepted the job at Job Corps, and I stayed there for 20 years where I helped to train young men and young women, and, and I was in an administrative role. I ended up working for the Department of Labor, the National Job Corps, ended up being a consultant for, just, I was going everywhere, just spread, you know, and it was fun for me, and at last I saw how to, they would deal with things that great and how it paid off, mm -hmm. because I was in this, this um, uh, some of the records office, down in Savannah, he had brought his nurse in. He wanted me to evaluate, because I evaluated everything. I fired doctor. Oh, God, me. I went from it to fire a doctor. That was the sweetest thing of my life. You know, this is for this nurse. This is for me, you know. And of course, they had done something, you know, made recommendations, and I sent to the National in, in DC. But this doctor was talking with me too. Supposed to talk about what he wanted me to do with the nurse that was in there who was employed by him. But he kept talking, he kept looking at her. And I said, Excuse me, uh, did, did you call me to come out here to work and to evaluate your program? Uh, yeah. I said, Well, why are you looking at her? <laughs> why, why, why is it she's not talking to me? You know, and I say, because I could get on a plane, bus, or whatever, and go back to Atlanta. I mean, this is what I think Grady prepared me to do, is to have the gumption to say, you know, and God, of all small, don't, don't bother with me. I'm his child, and he has another plan for me if this is going to work out. So he said, oh, I asked you to come. I asked you to come. And then, um, you know, from there, I went, to New York. I went to New York, I went all over the city, that's from everywhere. And I didn't know what I was doing, but I was supposed to be <laughs> saying, well, you know what I'm saying, I didn't do anything that different than was in the book. I just read the book. And the other people wouldn't read the book. And so then they made me come and read the book. <laughs> Getting a lot of experience, but I also found out the same system that exists in one place exists in another yeah. place. I had written a program for uh, uh, for, ger uh, for geriatrics and uh, the care and all this, and, and, and I didn't realize that they could steal your program. It did, it sold my program. I, I, wrote a, I did a little pamphlet to make five notes, man. In the uh, in the library back there, and I didn't. The the, 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 the people of my own color. This is what gets you. Excuse me. I just got to say this. When you have worked hard and you have helped your fellow man to come up and to get up, and you had the same nurses turn around and stick stones or daggers in your back. That is what hurt. We hurt ourselves when we do not support each other. Yeah. <laughs>
Well, they're welcome to step up to the mic. <laughs> um, try to bring it to you. And while while we're uh, getting people ready, you know, it's interesting that I hear your story and I hear my story. It's not quite as bad, <laughs> but being the first African American woman in the newsroom as a journalist with all white men. <laughs> later on about uh, the work that you've been doing with the dolls and I think that people are going to want to see that. Um, so if everyone wants to ask a question, if you come in, come on down. Don't be shy. And just introduce yourself and then you can ask a question or make a comment. Uh, good afternoon. My name is Teresa Major, retired head. And this question is to Colonel Hall. Colonel Hall and I worked together for a long time in, in the 1397 U.S. Army Hospital. And Colonel Hall, just tell us a little bit about the challenges and a little bit about working for the U.S. Army. Well, I know Grace prepared me, going to church prepared me, and, uh, and I think pretty much I act the same way all around. Like I said, I'm slick, I can be high class aggressive. Uh, I try to come, and I try to get you in such a way that you're so kind and gentle, you don't even know who you got. So that's the best way to do it. and. Um, I've always tried to be fair and honest. But do I think my fairness and honesty will hurt you? I won't tell you, but I'll go to somebody I have confidence who will keep their lips together. Mm -hmm. And then, uh, where do you feel sorry for you? And I'm going to try. And some people you can help and some people you can't. But if I can't help you, I don't, I don't want to hurt anybody. You know, I feel my pain and I feel your pain. And I say, if it weren't for God, that could be me. And so just like she was saying, I really believe, and I can tell everybody in the world, if there are two angels on this earth, they were my mother and her sister Lynn. And as wild and stupid and whatever that I am, deep within me, I got a lot from them. So how to be compassionate at times. So in the 3397, again, it's just amazing how things happen. When the unit decided to move right. right. their headquarters from Atlanta to Augusta, and like you say, people all the same color don't necessarily support each other. So anyway, uh, she had a head nurse there, a chief nurse there, and I was the chief nurse in Atlanta. And believe you, our unit was a 1,000 bed hospital unit. We had sections in Orlando, uh, North Carolina, Asheville. Columbus and in Atlanta Metro, we drilled at seven hospitals in Atlanta. Northside, uh, Brady, you know, Piedmont, everywhere else. Okay, so here I'm in charge of all these people, my good folks in the back, and everybody else who's in the very United States, and Army of Military, salute to all of us. Anyway, so when it got time to make the decision who would be the chief nurse, they were moving headquarters down to Augusta. So now in Atlanta, like I said, everybody loved me. I mean, I don't have any problem getting along with people. So, uh, and there was everybody down there was Caucasian but one, and he was the same rank as me, a colonel. And so he was pulling and pulling and pulling for that other girl. And just like you say, I think back in the day, too, we could just have diplomas. Some of us are fortunate to get out of our guard. Some are fortunate to get out of masters. Those of us who want to are fortunate to get the PhD. 
I thought I, I had had enough. I got a brother who had a PhD. We could tease him and say he got one for all of us. Really. <laughs> <laughs> That's the time of that. But anyway, uh, he fought to the nail. We were in the room in Atlanta at, at our territory. And he would just be speaking up for her, speaking up for her, and whatever. So number one, I said, hey, Paul, why are you in the grave? Whatever, but it's just interesting. The same Bible that you had in the grave. And I you say it's not always the other people. Sometimes the worst oh. enemy of your family members, yeah. But uh, like I said, I think I've learned how to survive because I stayed in that position, I think, six or seven years. Uh, and then once I got out, they don't, that don't put you out. And another thing that happened too is I got a chance to uh, be on active duty during that chill, that storm. And we were a backup hospital, so we didn't have to go overseas. But we filled about 30 installations, including um, West Point throughout the United States. And from our unit, everywhere we went, they begged, why don't you all come on active duty? I mean, that's just how sharp the third to and so, that's it. Thank you for your service. And I'll thank you for your service. Um, my name is Vanessa. Good afternoon. It's been a pleasure talking to you, listening to you ladies. I mean, there's so much knowledge because my mother, uh, I want, first I want to build a couple of points. I wanted to tell you as far as like envy and jealousy, there is no color thing to that. <laughs> I mean, envy and jealousy is just, okay. yes, yeah. you know, because I was trying to go become a nurse at Tuskegee mm -hmm. Nursing School and I had to drop off because I didn't pass the test for my affordable point. Mm -hmm. So, I just wanted to mention that. <laughs> but um, I wanted to also mention you know, saying my mother was a nurse. She loved being a nurse. I remember polishing her white shoes and starching her hat, you know, to go to work. And she loved being a nurse. And um, I, I, she would not often talk about the things that how she's being treated at work. But I, but she, when she did speak about it, it's some of the same things that what you ladies are talking about. Mm -hmm. And um, but she used to always talk about um, Jewish doctors. What was your experience with the Jewish doctors? I happened to work at Mount Sinai in Cleveland, and again, you know, I was just like we say, a great, excellent nurse, and I worked pediatrics, so. Because of my experience, the doctors all, always wanted me to take care of cleft lip, cleft palate, any specialty. They even wrote on the chart to be careful for Georgia was very different. 
And I noticed that when I came here in 73. Um, the schools still weren't integrated. I mean, they were just in the process of integrating the schools. I want to give a shout out. This is diverse, but I see my church member, and though there was one, you know, one of the eerie things about being at Green was 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 19, 1961, civil rights. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I knew that students in Clark, Morehouse, and all were parading right out there in front of Grady Hospital. The Atlanta student movement, yes. Yeah, and I was a student there. And not only that, uh, the drop-off point for a rest stop was Anderson, Alabama. Mm -hmm. So whenever I would go home for the weekend, I was terrified that I might get bummed because I remember there were those freedom ride buses mm -hmm. going right yeah. there yeah. getting uh, bummed. And I also felt very, very uneasy because my people begged me, begged me, begged me. I was at my house a couple of times and the kids were downtown mm -hmm. being bought by dogs. And if I had figured out a way to get out of there, and, and one thing, I said when well, things happen, for like she said, if you blink your eye or whatever, great, it put you out. Mm -hmm. And I really wanted my degree, my nursing thing, and whatever. But that was a conflict for me. And not only that, because uh, Martin Luther King's, Dr. Martin Luther King's senior and junior, their church, that's where I attended when I was a student. Yeah. So as he was getting involved in the movement, here I was. And another plug in, too, the reason why I felt really, really uneasy. My mother was finishing up her baccalaureate degree at, uh, in Alabama. Mm -hmm. I was there for the Rosa Park. Oh, and so when the buses were empty, I, I went down there for a weekend or whatever, and we got cats downtown. And so, like I say, I think my prayers came out with them, but I was petrified, I was conflicted. But somehow, like I said, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. And uh, I don't know if she's here or not. One of the yeah, I won't call her name, but anyway, so there are some things that have nothing to do, say, with the grading of the whole situation. Yeah, the climate. But because of people like that, you all have to get written, like uh, Hallwell, mm -hmm. yeah. Street Bank, or yeah. Ward, or whatever. The Dennis Benjamin, I mean, all these people I knew. Oh, yeah. Well, and I have to give yeah. a shout out. Um, I see you, Mattel. Um, yeah. Miss yeah. Jesse Hill. Yeah, oh, yeah, where's my Azira Hill. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 She and I have yeah. known each other a long time. But yeah. us in, in many a school, uh, you would think we would have learned something about the history of nurses from a black perspective, mm -hmm. but we didn't. Mm -hmm. We didn't know anything about the history of nursing. We didn't know what was going on around Grady. It was like we were isolated. I, I didn't even Did you up there in this place? Oh yeah. yeah. <laughs> they they did not even really. I mean, we were right home. I have to say that. Oh. <laughs> but there was, there was it was just a whole isolation. There was there was civil rights going on the outside. People were marching. We were on the inside. There was a whole different uh, milieu or setting going on in there. And when we went and we went to Tuskegee now. Remember Tuskegee was shooting folks up and down that what was it last chance? We would go to the last chance, the first chance. Yeah. The last first chance was a chance. The dry country. Right. Yeah. The last chance. Yeah. Go to other things. <laughs> okay. So and we didn't even know that that kind of thing was going on. I went. I I decided to go to get some big make posters for our class in Chicago. Uh, uh, so we, I went and I thought, oh, there's nobody in here with me. <laughs> they have really, they, they really are in that customer's out. So I said, well, do you have a, 
supposed to go to everybody's store, look at me for a minute, you want to you know, get the poster, and I want to go, what? You all so kind. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that the civil rights movement was at the height as well, and we could have been killed down there and not know what was going on. They never told us anything about the history of nursing, period, and the history of black nursing. We didn't know anything about We learned that after on our own. I mean, that's a, that's a sad thing. And the thing, nobody knew that we spent one year at Spelman. We are part of Spelman. We spent one year at Spelman College. And the first nurse that uh, was over grade, superintendent, they call her, was from Spelman. Where she started the hospital in there, who managed? She started a hospital at Spelman. Right. And when it closed down, it's, uh, she petitioned the Fulton County and Georgia uh, Assembly to force the school to be transferred to Grady. And so here again, the ministers and community people in uh, Atlanta supported her. That was way back here, you know, uh, Lou Andrews. So, and again, she was a Spelman graduate. She was the first black nurse yeah. in the state of Georgia. At so mm -hmm. But I missed the memo because I did a sit in. That's what I'm saying. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad you did. Thank you for representing. <laughs> Thank you. Come by the door and kick me up. And that was something to say, Miss Willis, that white boy can't come to the door. So he stopped me on the corner. So I got in that over and kick it at Newberry. And as far as I know, I may be the only one. Maybe smoke lunch. Yeah, I said, I was trying to do it. And the last time I did it, I did it from the car across the land. And I sat down and looked at me and said, You get up, you black thing. And you want to talk with me? I can call my friend. Thank you. 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 Thank you.
But the reason was that I didn't speak English much. And I came here to get an education. And I concentrated on that. Yes, that was a civil rights movement and I was scared to death. But what uh, encouraged me was that I didn't have to stay here. I came to get an education. I was going to do that and go home until Mr. <laughs> <laughs> persuaded me to come back at this point. And uh, I did not work much in training because of the, well, I had a baby immediately, almost. Uh, the following year I had a child and I needed to, didn't have any family, so needed to provide, you know, for the child. And, but all the, um, the babies, and pre-related were reserved for the whites. So I did work uh, with uh, Geneva Boykins with the as a clinical instructor uh, shortly after when was there. But it was briefly because I applied for the public schools um, school nursing and I got that and that was absolutely perfect and I enjoyed it. But I had great respect for the preparation I got for Brady that took me a long way. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Another civil rights people walking down is one of the reasons that Atlanta didn't go through what Birmingham and Montgomery went through was because of people like Mr. Hill, because when the kids were jailed, he would bail them out. Wow. He was the banker for the civil rights movement wow. because he ran um, the Atlanta Life Insurance Company. Mm -hmm. and, and so he made the way to make it easier for, um, for the children and students and adults to be able to do that. And he would let people off work too, wouldn't he? The protests, yeah. <laughs> He'd let them take their lunch hours or whatever they want to do to participate. Yes. Alonzo Herndon, yeah. who was um, founder, um, but that's that's what happened in Atlanta. It's a little different. Did I stop them? <laughs> okay, go ahead. Hi. Good afternoon. My name is Yolanda Eames Crawford, and I'm a certified nurse. <coughs> and I'd like to address Dr. Howard, um, Colonel um, Kenneth Hall, and Ms. Pulis, who have been stepped away from us. Yes. I just like to say, as a practicing nurse for over 40 years, um, I thank you all for everything that you went through and what you've done. Um, I can say, I don't know, proudly or whatever, but when you were telling your stories of how your instructors were, it brought back kind of like PTSD moments <laughs> <laughs> of being on the floor. Um, in, um, at Chance, I went to school at the University of Florida, and speaking of being isolated when you're only two, and um, Mrs. Willis said how you were referred to as you people. Um, I could say in 79, we were still you girls, <laughs> or you people, um, and there would be just comments made that would, you know, make you feel like you were, but you had to hold your demeanor. I remember many times my friend with my cohort, she would say, I would want to make a comment because they would throw out all kinds of incorrect facts about African Americans. Right. And you know, you wanted to say it, but in that same way, uh, Colonel, as you wanted to get that degree as well. You had to hold yourself and give it back to them in a you know nice, sharp manner, but polite manner. So I just thank you ladies very much. I attended a prayer breakfast last Saturday by the uh, Atlanta Black Nurses Association and wish oh, yeah. ladies could have been there. And if there are any Function in the future. Would love to have you, and I thank you for your stories. I thank you for your tenacity and all of your hard work. God bless. Hi, my name is Sharon Knuckles Williams, and I'm a great grad. Um, I went to Brady primarily because my mom finished Brady in 1942, and she was among the first nurses to be in the um, army, the Colored Army Nurses Corps wow. <laughs> in 1943 she entered. But one of the things I wanted to say was just uh, how much rating meant to 
us because um, we got so many skills and we did so much there. And it really taught us to be true, true nurses. Um, I remember when I entered in 1964, that was the first class, first integrated class. And it, I call it the class of confusion because <laughs> we had the three schools of nursing then, the colored school, the white school, and the integrated school. And I had so looked forward to going to Spelman. And they sent us to Georgia State College. And that was, we were the only ones over there. I think there were maybe two upperclassmen there. And then instead of going to Tuskegee, we went to Milledgeville. Oh, oh, oh. And Milledgeville still had the slave blocks in the downtown area when we were there. And we lived in the halfway house with the patients. So that was that was very disappointing. But all in all, I can say I am proud to be a great nurse, and I'm proud to be among the great nurses because we've got excellent. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, my name is Kaya. Sorry, sorry. My name is Kaya. Uh, I was in. I was a patient in the psych ward three years ago. It's kind of a crazy story, but the FBI came to my door and escorted me there because I had a uh, Turkish, Kurdish last name, Erdogan, like the capital of the, uh, the Kurdish territory in the north of Iraq is Erdogan. But it's a long, long story, but the bottom line is um, Grady has basically saved my life. For the, uh, actually, two times I was a patient, not one, but twice. I was impatient this winter after a friend died. But I can say honestly, from the bottom of my heart, grateful to every nurse on the 13th floor of Grady. Just, but I, I can leave it at that. But the main question I have, I guess, is um, when, or what year, did the first Grady nursing school student have contact with the Emory Nursing School. Meaning, like, what was the year where the first student from Grady Nursing School was accepted into the Emory University Nursing School? No, that's strange, too. Mike. <laughs> Emory students so, came to Grady for a lot of their clinical rotation, even though right. they had Still is like that. Yeah. yeah. But uh, I was accepted into Emory's master's program in 1975. And uh, like I said, Bernard Bellamy was the first one accepted in 1962 okay. into the master's program. So that's when they integrated the uh, master's program. Now, but uh, people go over there with PhDs and everything else. Uh, but the, the year that the first person who was in the great nursing school. Black. Black. 1962. Bernard Bellamy. She graduated from Grady, I guess, in the 50s. Right. And she went to uh, Tennessee to get her baccalaureate degree. And then uh, she, and not only she, it was not a one, it's two. Yeah. Alex Saxon, who was also a great nurse. No, she did this. I don't know. Anyway, uh, what happened is, I don't know what I had quite right. They didn't want Charlene Hunter at uh, Georgia, they didn't want Hamilton Homes down there. And most people don't know that they're not the two first blacks that attended the University of Georgia. <coughs> the first black that attended the University of Georgia, uh, I think she's a librarian. They had her on PBS about two years ago. So. Hmm? Mary Frances Okay, so what happened is she had gotten her baccalaureate somewhere else, and then she locked the program at uh, Georgia. And so she came down here and wrote in a master's program. So the Hunters and uh, Hamilton, they were the first baccalaureate, and they finally gave the recognition, I think about, what, a month or two of them? To that young lady who was the first one who graduated from the University of Georgia, and that was in their master's program. But for that long, What was that year? Mm -hmm. UGA. Yeah. What year was that? Well, I was at Grady in 60, Hamilton Holmes was over there as a regular student then. She and Charlie were down there 
I had common students. I had the other, uh, the uh, cause was the black school. I had hopes been for the white school. I was responsible for all of those students, and I was a brand new graduate. Still, no great nurse would help me. But I survived. After being there a couple of months, at an end of the pregnancy, which ruptured on the floor. Oh. I had to go to the hospital, and they brought me back. They kept calling my doctor, asked him, when is she coming back? When is she coming back? We don't have anybody to do our students. <laughs> Dr. Howard Golden was my doctor. He said, if they want to know, why don't they call me? I said, you better talk to them. If I mean, I have a child when I get back. He said, oh, you want to have a job? I went back. And I said, I can't do this. Man. I can't do this. I just can't do it. So I left. <coughs> they had a site floor that was on the eighth floor. That's when Emma came in. So I went to that site floor on the eighth floor. And that's where I stayed. But I left crazy. I never looked back. I don't care. I know about the struggles. I know about going to class one day. And she was certainly had came in and um, did our class. That instructor, her name was Miss Lee. I know Miss Lee was still there. The short name. And um, I guess we had a rebel class to occur. There were 63 of us. And when Dr. Wilson got to press his Thomas Nicholas, and we all got up and walked out of the class. That was the end of that one. Anyway, long story short, there wasn't a student 
that asked for, and he had 550 students that were responsible for. So there was a student that didn't take the, I didn't take the time, I know that I didn't take the time to, to talk with as a daughter of mine. I, and it's, at some point you see yourself in those, those persons. And so what you do is, it's like George Washington uh, said, let out your bucket where you are, let out your bucket oh, to touch those lines that you see daily. And mm -hmm. the church is a good place to start. I, I don't know why we don't have a health education program in churches that speak to not only women's health, but men, uh, men as well. Uh, and yeah, the whole gamut. And it's, it's about the most careful, you know, you, you capitalize on that group. It doesn't take all day. It's not going to take a job because the press can still move. And, and all day. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh -huh. But the point is that we can meet, we cannot do church as usual. Mm -hmm. We're going to have to reach out mm -hmm. and get the unchurched. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and do some things with them because they're the ones who are not getting the message. And we're going to have to extend ourselves beyond the area of our home, as um, my sister said. We're going to have to get out, get get involved, and not just say, you know, I saw, and let's see what's going on. Then what can I do, Lord? And, I'm, and I, I have a, 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 a back, because I just see if I stand up. But, I counsel more people at home mm -hmm. than I do. I guess not really about that some so. But, but the Lord can use us just where we are. And we have to ask him, Lord, don't let this opportunity pass. Because that person will tell somebody else, and that person will call you, and you get your a, a group call that you can call. You know, not four or five folk in here, right? Right. Okay, so then you can add on to that. So you be the catalyst for that change. Thank you so much. Thank you to all of you who attended. I know you enjoyed it. Uh, and I do that. It was a really an education for me as well because, like you say, there's so little that has been said about the role of nursing and especially nurses of color. So this has been a treat to be able, and I'm so glad that it's being videotaped so um, so other people will have a chance to see it. And we were on Facebook Live, so uh, hopefully we can be sharing this with uh, on our Facebook pages. Uh, we'll find out where it is on Facebook and uh, uh, hopefully share it. But thank you so much. And I want to also mention, and I think you may be talking about the doll project, but can you just tell us a little bit about the doll project? Uh, well, I started. I, <laughs> <laughs> I started making the doll. I think in twenty eleven, and it was uh, just people had such an interest. I just kept adding to it. Then I came up with the segregation and the integration and. I thought we had a story that we had never told before. We just accepted coming to grade and we were so happy to be nurses. We forgot the ugly. And so I wanted to present the ugly because Brady, when they tell the story, we're not there. We're not into it. When you come into Brady, uh, they had a showcase and they it was like, there was not a black nurse represented in the showcase. So one day I just came to the director with the doll and I said, make it happen. And she put her in the showcase and that's how we got in that showcase. And then I realized a lot of us didn't know the history and we didn't know the different uniforms. We didn't know Ludi Andrews. And I just thought from scratch and what you see next door is the end results. And I had, I'm a pack rat, so I had kept all the books basically. 
Some of them I couldn't predict because the backs are all just everything. But I have them. And uh, so that's how it all began for me. Thank you. Until I did that, that great hospital, and uh, on that large scale, that was a task. But I surprised myself because I wanted it the old great, and I wanted that backdrop for those dogs. And so that's how. And I did the little dresses you see. I wasn't a seamstress either. My mother was, and I sat next to her and watched her. And I must have absorbed a lot of what she was doing. Because I didn't start none of this to after retirement. Mm. <laughs> and that's a great segue. <laughs> because you're going to have a chance to see it if you have. Yeah. Okay, that wasn't that a wonderful program? Okay. So before I show you here today, um, I want to acknowledge a couple of people that weren't able to be here. The very nurses that were, were answered the call but weren't able to be here today. Um, Leela May Byrne Sorden was a member of class of 1945 or 46, I'm not quite sure. Um, and Ms. Carrie Alloway Pete, which was a member of, who was a member of the September 1953 class, um, couldn't be here. We um, also want to make sure we thank the friends of the Auburn Avenue um, Research Library who were, were generous to support um, the reception that is about to occur after here. Um, and now I want to acknowledge all of you ladies that are in the audience. So if you are a member of the class of the, the, we're going to do my decade. Uh, so if you are a member of any of the classes in the 1940s, please take a, take a stand so we can give you the applause that you deserve. I know we're asking a lot in the 1940s. <laughs> all right. So if you are a member of a graduating class from 1950s, take a stand. Stand up. Yeah. If you graduated from the program in the 1960s, please stand up. Yeah. If you are graduated from the 70s, please stand up. If you are a graduate of the 1980s, please stand. <laughs> On May 15th of this year, District Four Commissioner Natalie Hall will present a proclamation at the Fulton County Board of Commissioners televised meeting. Grady nurses, family, and friends are invited to attend this meeting. The meeting begins at 10 a.m. and will be held at 141 Pryor Street. So that is on May 15th, there will be another proclamation um, that Ms. That Commissioner Madden Hall will be giving at the Fulton County Government Center, 141 Pryor Street. Um, also, all of you are asked to stop at the Carrie McPheeters Gallery, which is the large gallery right here on the first floor. Before leaving, there will be many interview sessions, and we would love to get your stories recorded. Um, you know, at least a short time, a couple of minutes of your time, so we can at least get those down. Um, and lastly, in June, um, you are all invited to tell your stories even further in more detail. Um, if you're interested, sign up at the information desk in out front before leaving. The interviews will be conducted here at the Open Avenue Research Library and will be preserved and archived in the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. Um, we are working with the Story Corps. To get these, to get your stories down, and they will be a part of the library conference in Washington. So, that would be a good one. I call it a good one. I'm pretty sure Mrs. Strong will reach out to you, or you can reach out to Mrs. Strong, and she will get that information to you. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. It was a wonderful discussion, and um, enjoy. Thank you. Thank you.